This episode of the Modern Therapist Survival Guide is sponsored by Buying Time. Buying Time is a full team of virtual assistants with a wide variety of skill sets to support your business. From basic admin support, customer service, and email management to marketing and bookkeeping, they've got you covered. Don't know where to start? Check out the systems inventory checklist, which helps business owners figure out what they don't want to do anymore and get those delegated ASAP. You can find that checklist at buyingtimellc.com forward slash systems dash checklist. Listen at the end of the episode for more information. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Hey, Modern Therapists. We're so excited to offer the opportunity for one unit of continuing education for this podcast episode. Once you've listened to this episode, to get CE credit, you just need to go to moderntherapistcommunity.com, register for your free profile, purchase this course, pass the post-test, and complete the evaluation. Once that's all completed, you'll get a CE certificate in your profile, or you can download it for your records. For a current list of our CE approvals, check out moderntherapistcommunity.com. Once again, hop over to moderntherapistcommunity.com for one CE once you've listened. Woohoo! Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Whithelm with Katie Vernoy, and this is our first continuing education eligible podcast. And we're going to go a little bit long format today. Today, we're going to be exploring an ethical issue around therapists making public statements. And this is becoming what would seemingly be more and more prevalent as more and more of us have access to things like social media outlets. The underpinnings of a lot of this debate start back in the 1960s with a little story about Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater. Now, Barry Goldwater was running for president in the 1964 election. And for those of you American history buffs, you probably know he did not win. And (laughs) this this is partially blamed on the way that the Lyndon Johnson campaign framed Barry Goldwater in response to Fact Magazine presenting a special issue that was titled The Unconscious of a Conservative, a special issue on the mind of Barry Goldwater. Wow. And this was in response or a play on the words of Barry Goldwater's book, The Conscious of a Conservative. So uh, what Fact Magazine had done is they had sent out a survey to over 12,000 psychiatrists, of whom about 2,400 responded. And this was asking these psychiatrists' opinions of the mental health status of Senator Barry Goldwater. Now, the results of this survey ranged a little bit all over the place. About 27% of the overall people responded said that Mr. Goldwater was mentally fit. 23% said that they didn't know enough to make a judgment. And a whole lot said things like, Mr. Goldwater is a megalomaniac, paranoid, grossly psychotic, and some even offered specific diagnoses including schizophrenia and narcissistic personality disorder. Oh my goodness. That sounds pretty familiar. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. This has come up recently in a little, just a little bit. (laughs) And part of the point of today's episode is where some of this debate has been in the last several years, as far as America, how the rules have gotten to where we are and what this means for us at this point in time. Now, a lot has been said, and we will get into this a little bit later in the episode, about some of the more recent publications and recent debates in the field, including books like The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump by Therapy Reimagined speaker Bandy X. Lee and some of her colleagues. We will be discussing her later and kind of where our responses are as a profession and some recommendations at the end of the episode. So getting back to Barry Goldwater. Must we? (laughs) (laughs) I'm joking. I'm joking. 
So Goldwater ended up suing Fact Magazine and the publishers for libel based on this, and Goldwater ended up winning this. Now, in the cases, Goldwater was issued one dollar as <laughs> compensatory damages and seventy-five thousand dollars in punitory damages to the publisher of the magazine, Ralph Ginsburg. And this was upheld by the United States Court of Appeals in the Second Circuit, and the Supreme Court denied a, a petition to review it. So Goldwater ended up prevailing, but at the time, feeling like they have a little egg on their face of all of these psychiatrists making public statements, the American Psychiatric Association said, this is something where this might erode the trust in our professionals and therefore our profession. We can't have this. We have a sense of urgency that we need to address this. Let's take nine years to make a rule. <laughs> <laughs> nine years for a very important rule. Well, at least, at least we can't t say that they didn't think it out. <laughs> take time to really consider. <laughs> well, I, I point out a little bit of the nine years because what happened at the time is we were under the guidance of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association's second edition. Now, this was during a, a building towards the DSM-3, which was going to come out several years later in 1980. But for those of us who weren't practicing back in 1964 and answering questionnaires from Fact Magazine, there was a pretty fundamental difference between the DSM-2 and the DSM-3. And that difference was the DSM-2 was largely based in psychodynamic and psychoanalytic theory, which led to a lot of conjecture and potential bias in evaluating clients. Now, what the DSM-3 helped move us towards today's DSMs is created more of behavioral checklist observations. And so what many of these psychiatrists were conjecturing about Mr. Goldwater is assumptions about his upbringing, assumptions about mm. the relationships that he was having and the underpinnings of wherever their believed psychosis and megalomania diagnostics and observations about him would be based out of. So it really switched from being based in more of a clinician's theoretical orientation to what we know more at this point with the DSM-3, 4, 5, 5TR that's coming out, that it moves to more of observable and behavioral criteria. Am I hearing that right? You are hearing that absolutely correct. And so what the DSM-3 allowed is... Is somebody not getting out of bed? That's a feature of depression. Yes. Not based in whatever the DSM-2 criteria were before. And overall, as far as protecting, you know, diagnostics, making inter-rater diagnostics a little bit more consistent, this is generally seen as a good thing. Yeah. But some of the debates in the 60s and 70s, and has continued today is in the APA's interpretations of the Goldwater principle. I'm, I'm emphasizing principle here at this point. Okay. Is that there's some fear that if psychiatrists are making statements about political candidates, that if those candidates win, particularly executive offices within the US federal government, there may be fear that the federal government would reduce the reimbursement rates given to particularly psychiatrists for their services under things oh, like Medicare and Medicaid. So it was, there was money, money was talking here. Well, not necessarily any direct threats that I can find in my research about the setup of this, but there is the potential fear and who knows, there may be a president that might punish particular agencies or sectors of the economy if they are in fact elected. <laughs> I don't know if that could potentially happen, but that's where the American Psychiatric Association's concerns seem to have been lying. And, and it seems like they may not have been too far off. <laughs> 
<laughs> so what was the original intention of the Goldwater Principle then? So in some of our research here and a, a lot of our conversation here right now so far is some history that is provided by the British Journal of Psychiatry, an article called, It is Ethical to Diagnose a Public Figure One Has Not Personally Examined. This is a debate written by John Gartner, Alex Langford, and Eileen O'Brien. Now, in this, John Gartner had mentioned some personal communications that he had had with Dr. Alan Dyer, who was the last living member of the original APA Ethics Committee that drafted the APA's Goldwater response in 1974. Wow. This did lead me to looking at some more information that Alan Dyer has written. And fortunately, Dr. Dyer has a blog where he has written about the evolution of the so-called Goldwater Rule, an ethical cool. analysis. Can we put that in our show notes? We will include <laughs> links and or references to everything that we can in our show notes. So this is from uh, 2017, from this evolution of the so-called Goldwater Rule, an ethical analysis. And from Dr. Dyer, I'm quoting here. The first thing to appreciate about the so-called Goldwater Rule is that it is not a rule, but rather a principle. The APA's Code of Ethics is the annotations applicable to psychiatry of the AMA Principle of Medical Ethics, which explicitly state that the principles are, quote, not laws, but standards of conduct, which define the essentials of honorable behavior for the physician, end quote. Much of the current discussion applies rule-based legalistic thinking to a matter of professional judgment based on principle. In ethical theory, this would be a category mistake attempting to transform a teleological end-based approach into a deontological or rule-based approach. Okay, ethics nerd. I was trying to follow you there. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got teleological and deontological. I think I'm going to need a little bit of an explanation. Okay, so these are two different ways of looking at ethics. And okay keeping this as kind of a, a shorter conversation, because this isn't the point of the episode, but I think it helps to clarify what Dr. Dyer is saying here. Sure. Teleological is a type of consequentialist ethics. And what that means is that we need to look at the outcome of an action to determine if it was morally good or not. Whereas a deontological approach would be if there is any chance that an action could cause harm, you should not do that action. Okay. So if we're looking at deontological, it would be if something could be harmful, like clients in crisis in your office need to be hospitalized. Do you drive them to the hospital or not? It sounds like a deontologist, deontological, De deontologist, a deontologist, which doesn't sound like what it is. If a deontologist would say you should never have a client in your car, you should never drive your client to the hospital, you should never manage your client crisis alone. Correct? Yes, all of all of those lawyers and all of those insurance agents that would say, you know, oh, you got into an accident with with your client in the car, you are at fault for this. That is a deontological way of thinking. Okay. And then the teleological way would be that if you believe that you can be safe, you know, this client needs to get to the hospital soon, you know, there's, there's no transportation available and it's going to be hours and hours and this client is decompensating and needs to get to the hospital, but you have a strong relationship, you feel safe, you put them in your car, you get them over to the hospital because the end justifies the means. Close. And, and <laughs> what, what, I guess maybe the, the place of clarifying this is with the correct intent that if you reasonably believe that you could help this client get to the hospital and it was reasonably possible and something were bad to happen along the way, it's kind of more of the Good Samaritan approach that the intentions were correct. The, the fallout of it ended up being maybe not ideal, but if there's the potential to cause good, and as long as the intentions were good, you can morally judge that as good. 
Okay, but that still is sounding a little bit like the ends justify the mean. You are you you are correct here in that this is what Dr. Dyer is saying. This was he's saying that this was written as a way of saying use your judgment, be you know predictably well. This this mm-hmm. subcommittee said this is teleological. This is consequential. Have some professional judgment in doing this. Mm-hmm. And what has happened over the last 40 plus years is it has been interpreted through an entirely different and competing moral viewpoint that everyone seems to be taking as, well, just don't do this. Yeah. I see the complexity, though, because if we're looking at maybe not exactly the ends justify the means, but something where we are relying on individual professionals to have a good assessment of their motives to have a good assessment of what the consequence would be for public diagnosis. For example, um, do we feel like we can trust our professionals to make that judgment that, that the, the consequences are sufficiently positive and, and being able to work in that gray. And what Dr. Dyer is saying is that the APA says, No, those individual people can't make that decision. So we're looking at people making something very concrete, black and white, that actually has a lot of gray in it. And it's supposed to be professional judgment, not this is good or this is bad. Yes. Now, Dr. Dyer goes on to say, second thing to appreciate is that the Goldwater caveat called rule and understood by many psychiatrists as an absolute prohibition, is in fact embedded in an affirmative obligation of physicians to society, quote, a responsibility to participate in activities contributing to the improvement of the community and the betterment of public health. I take what Dr. Dyer is saying here as the intention behind this was that psychiatrists should still be looking at improving the overall communities and public health that they work in. That there's an honor of being a medical professional to serving the greater good of society. And that this Goldwater caveat is that we maybe don't make diagnostics about people without evaluating them. But maybe when we feel that there is a sense of danger to somebody We can use our professional and, in their case, medical knowledge to be able to make communications about that. I'm not clear that that's what the Goldwater rule is being interpreted as now, right? I mean, it seems like even saying anything has gotten to be taboo, according to the American Psychiatric Association. Oh, wait, there's more. (laughs) Okay, okay. (laughs) Keep going, keep going. Now, we also need to consider what the landscape of 1960s and 1970s world is as far as available information. Now, I grew up in a part of the country at a point in my life where with an antenna and good weather, we could get maybe four television stations. The Internet did not yet exist. (laughs) Cell phones were a thing that was only imagined on the Jetsons that... (laughs) You and me both, buddy. You and me both. (laughs) And this was several years after Mr. Goldwater was running for president. So the availability of information back at that time is much different than the landscape that we have today. Sure. You know, I, in my pocket, normally carry a device that has more computing power than the first spaceships that went to the moon. (laughs) Now. What I choose to do with it is make memes and send videos of cats to my wife, but I could also go and pull up videos of just about any public figure in a variety of different contexts that Mm -hmm. would allow for me as a mental health professional to at least say, yeah, what you're doing kind of looks sus. Uh, as the kids are using the, the language these days. It's like kind of looks what? Suspect. Is that what you're saying? Is yes. like for the old people in the audience, it's suspect that their your your behavior looks suspect. All right. Yes. <laughs> now in the 
intervening years, uh, this is back to Dr. Dyer's blog, points out that the 2013 version of the principles and annotations preserves the original language of the 1973 version. But the 2015 APA commentary on ethics and practice takes a more administrative and specific tone. It preserves the affirmative ethical principle better of improving the community and betterment of public health through education and evidence-based science. But it says, rather than offering opinions about a specific person, it's the best means of facilitating public education in some circumstances, such as academic scholarship about figures of historical importance, exploration of psychiatric issues, for example, diagnostic conclusions, may be reasonably provided that it has sufficient evidence base and is subject to peer review and academic scrutiny. Now, this means that you don't just go out as an individual and say, here's my opinion that needs to have a little bit of consensus here. But what the APA Ethics Committee did instead is started to reflect language that psychiatrists should not make any public statements about anybody, no matter what. And this was really the beginnings of where the dangerous case of Donald Trump, authored by Bandy X Lee and colleagues, ended up being a really big part of the debate here over the last now six years. And what the APA was seemingly trying to do is take the voice out of people saying, hey, trust me, I'm a doctor. I know what I'm saying. <laughs> and there were several questions published across you know, a number of different op-eds, some that appeared in places like the New York Times, that led to many of the professional organizations coming down more strictly on, on the emergence of the Goldwater Rule. And this is where in March 2017, the American Psychiatric Association released a statement saying, the APA remains committed to supporting the Goldwater Rule. Ah. And they gave three main points for the rationale of their opinion. Number one, when a psychiatrist comments about the behavior, symptoms, diagnosis, et cetera, of a public figure without consent, that psychiatrist has violated the principle that psychiatric evaluations be conducted with consent or authorization. So we're looking at consent as number one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Number two, offering a professional opinion on an individual that a psychiatrist has not examined is a departure from established methods of examination, which require careful study of medical history and firsthand examination of the patient. Such behavior compromises both the integrity of the psychiatrist and the profession. So that one sounds the most similar to the original intent, which is don't diagnose someone that you've not evaluated. Right. Right. Okay. And this is saying, don't do that because it makes us look bad. Pretty much. Okay. And third, when psychiatrists offer medical opinions about an individual they have not examined, they have the potential to stigmatize those with mental illness. Ah, so we got, there's no consent. It makes us look bad and it increases stigma. Yes. Okay. Now, turning this is maybe a question to you. You and I have both listened to a little bit of the news here in the last several years. <laughs> what have you heard Donald Trump being diagnosed with? Malignant narcissism is one. Um, he probably could be diagnosed with ADHD. He could potentially be diagnosed with psychopathy. I mean, like there's a lot of sociopathy, like there's, <laughs> which I guess is malignant narcissism, but I've heard a lot of different yeah. suggestions about yeah, yeah. what's possible. And I've heard some people even suggesting things like dementia on top of that. To be, sure. To be clear, these are things that Katie and I have heard. We're not actually We're making not saying commentary. they're true. <laughs> We're not diagnosing in public people. <laughs> One of the op-eds in the New York Times pointed out that in order for things like narcissism to be diagnosed, 
If you look in the DSM, and particularly where we are today, the DSM-5, that one of the features for diagnostics is that it has to be disturbing to the patient themselves. Mm. And therefore is actually an inaccurate use of a diagnostic, let alone the means to actually arrive there. Mm -hmm. Now, as I was mentioning earlier, there are lots of ways to get indirect observations of people these days. And maybe this calls into question the diagnosis or the diagnostic criteria of personality disorders where, hey, if one of the features of a personality disorder is that they're not bothered by the fact that they have that particular personality disorder, maybe that <laughs> needs to be looked at in, in future DSMs. Maybe we'll talk to somebody someday about that. But... <laughs> In response to the APA reaffirming this. So the American Psychiatric Association. The American Psychiatric Association. In response to a op-ed published on NewYorkTimes.com on March 7th, 2016, called Should Therapists Analyze Presidential Candidates? On March 14th, 2016, the then president of the American Psychological Association. So taking this out of the medical realm and mm -hmm. potentially a little bit more specific to providers of more traditional therapy, president of the American Psychological Association at the time, Dr. Susan H. McDaniel, wrote response to the article on whether therapists should analyze presidential candidates. And I'll read this in its entirety because it's about three paragraphs. The American Psychological Association wholeheartedly agrees with Robert Klitzman, PhD, that neither psychiatrist nor psychologist should offer diagnoses of candidates or any other living public figure they have never examined. Our association has declined requests from several reporters seeking referrals to psychologists who would make such speculations. Similar to the psychiatrist Goldwater rule, our code of ethics exhorts psychologists to take precautions that any statements they make to the media are based on their professional knowledge, training, or experience in accord with appropriate psychological literature and practice, and do not indicate that a professional relationship has been established with people in the public eye, including political candidates. When providing opinions of psychological characteristics, psychologists must conduct an examination adequate to support statements or conclusions. In other words, our ethical codes state that psychologists should not offer a diagnosis in the media of a living public figure they have not examined. So just diagnosis. I, it sounds like it also is going further into things that might be within the realm of psychology and not diagnosis, it was saying nothing could be in your professional opinion unless you've done a, an evaluation and then there would be confidentiality issues. So the, the question that I have is, is it just don't talk about public figures at all? That seems to be where both of the APAs are going with this language. Now, according to the Wikipedia article on the Goldwater rule, it is a citation needed statement on there as you know, we're citing our references here. And I wasn't able to substantiate this claim that Dr. McDaniel received a lot of pushback from members of the American Psychological Association about her stance and interpretation of the American Psychological Association direction and intention with this that apparently many members of the American Psychological Association felt that this was too specific and restrictive, and that as long as they were framing it within the characteristics of, hey, I haven't evaluated this guy, but based on these statements and these misapplication of following through on his own things, yeah, this one presidential candidate seems to have this diagnosis. But of course, they were eventually talking about the opportunity to say this about Kanye West. <laughs> now, I recognize that most of our audience are probably not psychiatrists, and most of our audience are probably not psychologists. And so I want to create kind of some space as far as where do our other professional mental health associations take stances on these kinds of things? And that would be the American Counseling Association, the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapists, 
National Association for Social Workers. And Katie and my participation with the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists, well, a state organization, they have 30 plus thousand members. We generally give them a say in national discussions as well. But before we jump to more of these master's levels organizations, Katie, what are you feeling as far as can we be talking about people publicly? So what I'm hearing is that you can, it's pretty clear that you should not diagnose publicly. I think the the folks who wrote The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump would disagree, but most of the, to, so far what you've talked about, APA and APA are saying don't diagnose. It seems like there's an ongoing discussion around whether we can give opinion on behavior. What is, how are the psychiatrists and other folks, to, how are we analyzing that piece about, can we talk about people in public? So this is going back to that uh, British Journal of Psychiatry and back to the uh, point made by John Gartner. He says that you don't have to diagnose to warn. In some cases, people may use public figures as a way of educating the public about diagnostic criteria such as narcissistic personality disorder, for example, and let readers draw their own conclusions. Hey, I haven't evaluated this particular candidate. These kinds of behaviors are generally consistent with narcissistic personality disorder. Once again, I haven't evaluated this person. They're not a patient of mine. Make your own conclusions. Now, I don't necessarily like that as a full you know, green light to go ahead and do this. I think that, as you pointed out at the beginning of the episode, that there's a lot of nuance to this conversation. And as professionals, we have to foresee some of the responsibility of saying, I'm not going to draw the conclusions for you, but I'm drawing the conclusions for you is not really good discussion of public health. But what Gartner's argument is, is that in the bottom line is many people may feel the duty to warn. And it, a duty to warn does not require a multi-axial diagnosis. And he uses the example, if someone is bringing a gun to your house, you only need to know that somebody is bringing a gun into your house. Yeah. A diagnosis is not needed. Well, and the question that I heard posed within, or I read posed within that, that debate is that, do we need opinions from psychological experts or psychiatric experts at all? Can we just not view it as a public, as a, as a general public? Can we not just view behavior and make our own assumptions and psychiatrists or, or therapists providing that expert opinion does more harm than good and isn't required? And it's a, a topic worth diving into, you know, part of where seeing the public really destigmatize mental health in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. we've seen this reflected in our practices and the need for mental health services over the last several years is the public is a lot more open to talking about the challenges that they face, but a lot of people misdiagnose without the robust background of training of how to properly assess people. And, sure. you know, how many people are you going to see on social media that, you know, complain about, oh, I'm, oh, I'm so OCD. I need to straighten out the books on my shelf. That's not really a diagnostic of obsessive compulsive disorder and tends to diminish what actual obsessive compulsive disorder is for those who properly have that condition. It's something where leaving this discussion out into the public really allows for things to be watered down in such a way that some of these diagnostics tend to lose all meaning. So to answer your question, I think that it's healthy to have professionals with a background to be able to offer this opinion. It's a matter of how it's done that is potentially there. But so far with the information that we're seeing from the American Psychiatric Association and the American Psychological Association is that any professional opinion about any public figure seems to be forbidden. 
So we're stuck with the experts being silenced, but then the guidance around how to actually provide expert opinions to the public seems to be a little bit limiting, at least from the two APAs. Yes. What are the master's level folks saying? That is an excellent question, and I'm glad that you're bringing it up. Looking at the four codes of the master's level organizations, this was summarized uh, pretty well in September of 2016 on psychotherapynotes.com by Dr. Ben Caldwell. And uh, I'll, I'll expand on on some of this because some of these things have been updated even since this blog goes. But starting with the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy, standard 3.11 simply requires that therapists exercise special care when making public their professional recommendations and opinions. There's no prohibition against diagnosing public figures according to AAMFT. Okay. The American Counseling Association, as far as within their ethical code, standard C6C, says that counselors speaking with the media base their statements on appropriate counseling literature and practice to ensure that their statements are otherwise consistent with the ACA Code of Ethics and to be clear about the nature of their relationship with those receiving the information. National Association of Social Workers, while they talk about dishonesty and multiple standards, they also require social workers to protect client confidentiality when dealing with the media. That's standard 1.7K, but they don't have any parallels to the Goldwater rule. The social workers really have no guidance at all. Not very much anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Camped. This has been updated since Dr. Caldwell's blog here, but uh, the Camps Code of Ethics 5.13, public statements, marriage and family therapists, because of their ability to influence and alter the lives of others, exercise caution when making public their professional recommendations or their professional opinions through testimony, social media, and internet content, or other public statements. CAMP also goes on to say 5.14, limits of professional opinions. Marriage and family therapists do not express professional opinions about an individual's psychological condition unless they have treated or conducted an examination and assessment of the individual, or unless they reveal the limits of the information upon which their professional opinions are based with appropriate cautions as to the effects of such limited information upon their opinions. Now, How do you take this from the four master's level organizations? I mean, it's a little confusing to me. I think there is certainly caution um, that we need to take and, and not do this lightly, not pop off on our podcast, make sure that we're not just giving diagnosis this willy nilly, that we actually are cautious, use our training understand our training. And then also I hear, I think primarily from camp, but maybe from some of the other ones that we need to make sure we put forward the limits that a pot of information that we have. So I've not assessed this person or this is something I've not seen, but my statement is being based on this body of knowledge and this, this information that I've been given. So it's a little more guidance, but it still is something where, you know, the the rules, it just, I mean, some of it feels like best judgment, which is a little bit more aligned to the the Goldwater principle, but it's, it's still hard to know what's going to be in the best interest of society, of the our professions, of the individuals that are in the spot, the public public eye that potentially are getting some of this stuff going on. Like it it just feels really complex to make a decision around diagnosis or public statements. So in April of 2018, the American Counseling Association published an ethics update by Perry C. Francis. Credited in Counseling Today, Perry C. Francis is a professor of counseling at Eastern Michigan University and coordinator of the Counseling and Training Clinic in the College of Education Clinical Suite, uh, member of the American College Counseling Association, and he chaired the Ethics Revision Task Force that developed the 2014 ACA Code of Ethics. 
And summarizing many parts of the article, he also points to E5 of the ACA Code of Ethics, which says, counselors take special care to provide proper diagnosis of mental disorders and dives into the discussion of what exactly is special care. And in the description, talks about that there's a list of behaviors and characteristics that make up not the entirety of a whole person. The DSM has been accused of being ethnocentric, and it's difficult to apply this to other cultures and contexts. Meanwhile, stakeholders like pharmaceutical companies welcome a growing list of diagnosable disorders and overall cautions that professionals who make real world statements might fail to take into account just the ramifications of what these statements might be saying, not only just to the public, but also to other businesses that work in mental health care. Therefore, as counselors, according to Perry Francis, we need to take special care to ensure that any diagnosis is made using the most appropriate assessment techniques, including a well-planned clinical interview and the most relevant instruments and tests. Part of taking that special care is taking into account the impact of culture on a client's life, including the fact that a client can live in multiple cultures. Perry Francis concludes this article by saying that The American Counseling Association has released a statement concerning publicly diagnosing the mental state of an individual. And it states in part, when publicly discussing public figures and others, professional counselors should avoid DSM and ICD related terms, especially the words diagnosis and disorder. Counselors should not attach a specific DSM or ICD diagnosis to any individual through messaging or statements in media outlets or social media. Avoiding public statements that label an individual with a mental disorder is in the best interests of the public. This approach aligns with one of the counseling profession's core professional values as stated in the preamble of the ACA Code of Ethics, practicing in a competent and ethical manner. So that seems pretty clear to diagnosis. Yes. Right. I mean, it's not about behavior. It's not saying this behavior is harmful. Like that's, I mean, AP, both of the APA seem to say like, Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like anything you say about a person, a public figure is too much. Whereas the, at least ACA is now saying, as long as it's not a diagnosis, you're good. That right? seems, that seems to be where the stance is here. Okay. So that's what the professional associations are saying. I mean, I don't like, I feel like we still need to talk about how someone would make these decisions. Well, let, let's take this out of the research and, and the publications here so far. And let, let's talk about, you know, what our observations of the landscape of our field is. You and I both know hundreds, if not thousands of therapists at this point, many of whom we're connected to on social media. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have lots of friends who are professionals who talk on podcasts and are connected in the media, some who are on TV shows uh, providing therapy. Yes. We see lots of people in these spaces talking about lots of things. Yeah. What do you see? I mean... I see folks who are very open and talking about their own concerns. And so they're able to put forward their own mental health journey as an example. I see people talking about treatment between, you know, kind of how people treat each other and, and those types of things. I mean, I think the, the treating someone on a TV show that feels like that's a, a demonstration of therapy with hopefully appropriate consents. And I don't, I mean, besides our foray into having Bandy on the podcast, I've not seen someone at least directly diagnose someone in public. I've seen people express concern about public figures or about the impact of public figures, but it feels a little bit more behavioral. And so kind of along the, the, the second line, which is, you know, these behaviors are of concern and this is why. But I don't know that I've seen a lot of the folks we know 
kind of saying like, this person is a malignant narcissist. Like I don't necessarily see that. Although now that I just said it out loud, I think I probably have seen that as well. How about you? What are you seeing? I know a lot of our listeners are, you know, maybe of the the same political ideologies as you and I, maybe they're not, maybe they make assumptions that they are. But what I do see is that, especially as there becomes more advocacy within communities around a diagnosis, you know, people coming from, for example, ADHD community, doing more to educate people about the things that go along with having ADHD that may be extra outside of the things listed within the DSM. Mm -hmm. Uh, Might see this same thing with any number of other diagnostic communities that come together. And what I see is also the inverse of some of these statements. And I particularly remember a time and seeing some discussions around Elon Musk making the claim that he was the first person with Asperger's to host Saturday Night Live. And this has yes. been some time in the past. Yeah. And many people had some opinions about this statement. And a lot of the commentary that I saw was professionals who also self-identified, and I don't know their diagnostic criteria, of being part of the autistic community, ended up feeling that either or making statements on their own social media that, hey, Elon Musk isn't one of us, doesn't belong Mm. on the spectrum. Now, these are professionals. I don't, you know, remember, and I don't, I'm not pulling them up here, but I think it's just as important to caution saying the absence of a diagnosis without evaluating somebody is potentially just as damaging or dangerous as it is that saying somebody is a certain diagnosis. Now that you say that, I think there's also been an an impulse, eh, maybe impulse is the wrong word, but there's been some of the, you're not, you know, you aren't representative of us, like you talked about, whether it's Elon Musk or an original poster. And then there's also in comments, well, you definitely have this diagnosis. You definitely seem depressed or you definitely seem X, like people offering more diagnostic you know, beyond the, like, you should talk to your therapist about this, uh, more of a diagnostic, what you're describing in this 50, you know, 50 word post suggests to me that you must be X diagnosis. And so to me, I think we are a little fast and loose in the more casual public spaces, like social media groups and those types of things. But I think there is an element of the, the inverse diagnosis, that's interesting because I hadn't thought about it that way. Like certainly saying, hey, this person has this diagnosis, that seems pretty clear. But saying this person with a self who self-identified doesn't have a diagnosis, how is that harmful? What, how do you say, what do you think, why do you think that's harmful? We haven't presented somebody with a proper assessment ourselves to publicly comment on what their diagnosis is. If we, we may not know their medical or psychological history. It may be, sure. and, and not framing it within the context of where you're basing that opinion is where these ethics codes are saying that that is unethical behavior. Mm-hmm. That you may only be making a snap judgment based on you know a few clips of a sketch comedy show. You may be incredibly biased based on the types of news outlets that you receive your information from and particularly you know somebody like elon musk that doesn't have quite the number of televised appearances that somebody like a donald trump might that the limited amount of available information that you have ends up becoming where if they truly do have this diagnosis, you as a professional are making a statement that invalidates their experience. And one of the main principles of all of our codes of ethics is a stance of non-maleficence, not creating harm. Yeah. 
It's interesting because I think it's it's harder, I think, for some of our audience to be like, well, poor Donald Trump, poor Elon Musk, poor billionaires. Right. And I think in truth, we actually need to pay attention to that because to me, they're, you know, although some people might disagree with me, they're humans, too, and they they could be harmed by the statements that are made. For most of us, I think maybe I'm putting myself too much in that. I think it's easier to 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 look at this as a problem when it's someone who is more traditionally oppressed. You know, if if someone who legitimately, whether they claim it or not, has a mental health diagnosis, it doesn't prove them unfit for for being in a public position, whether it's, you know, a government official or whatever, like if we, if we start making the case that they are problematic, not only are we potentially breaking the Goldwater rule, but we're also potentially increasing stigma as, as the APA had said, but we're also potentially harming the ability to have a more diverse representative pool in our our legislation. We may be oppressing folks because we've made this our job to try to protect society from folks who are mentally ill. And that feels really bad. I think the arguments against doing this in a, a more directed way to public figures, that's where it sits with me as appropriate. Like I I was celebrating the, the the dangerous case of Donald Trump, and I and I don't know that I would say like, hey, that was a bad idea, but I think the precedent concerns me if we then use these types of stratagems to try to get folks either not elected or out of office. And then bringing this back to earlier in the episode, the dangerous case of Donald Trump, a pretty significant portion of that book is the arguments of the needing to step outside of the code of ethics as far as a duty to warn Mm -hmm. that does not necessarily focus on the diagnostic criteria, but more so on behaviors that interpersonally end up feeling dangerous to people who have spent their career studying dangerous behaviors. Sure. And, and, and listening to Bandy speak, in our conference, like she was talking about the the problem of violence. And there were specific, very public displays of incitement to violence or violence by Donald Trump that I think was potentially where she based her concern about and her d- duty to warn. And it also comes from a decades long history of that being her particular area of study yes. and specialty, yeah. yeah, which is quite a bit different in a number of ways of picking a celebrity and a random page in the DSM and going through some sort of BuzzFeed type evaluation and throwing your opinion out on the internet. Which is kind of what the original Goldwater thing was, right? It was a magazine reaching out to a whole bunch of psychiatrists who were like, yeah, I think he's nuts. (laughs) Pretty (laughs) much. It was, I mean, granted, it was a pool of folks, but it sounds like you described it as all over the place. And it wasn't something where they even necessarily individually were thinking, oh, this is going to be public record. It was more like, oh, in the aggregate, this is kind of fun. I'm anonymously putting forward my opinion about a candidate I don't like. And so this does bring to the overall discussion that making public statements as viewed by any of these professional organizations does include even your own personal social media. Yeah. And there needs to be the caution. And this is really the emphatic point here. There needs to be the caution of how you're framing these statements. Now, one of my Facebook memories to recently was about the day that Donald Trump was inaugurated as the 45th president of the United States. And for listeners of the podcast, I think I've described before, I was in a pretty serious bike accident about 10 years ago. And one of my social media posts from inauguration day was of the presidential limo driving down the streets of Washington, D.C., solely in the bike lane. 
And Ugh. my response, I mean, they had all the streets closed down. It was parade. It was inauguration day. Yeah. But yeah. My, my statement was, as a survivor of a pretty traumatic bike accident, this administration is not off to a good start. <laughs> <laughs> now, you obviously get the humor of this, you know, yes. maybe even, you know, if you were to read too much into my statements, oh, is that, is that trauma speaking? Is that, you know, ah. the, it, and I'm talking about my own, you know, experiences in potential mental health here, but you got the humor out of it knowing sure. me. Yes, I do. But it was not about Donald Trump. It was about the administration. Yeah. And there is a, a crafting that we need to consider in making any of these kinds of statements. We're all going to have opinions about many different people. And, yes. and that is fine. Your responsibility as a professional is to know that every statement that you make that goes outside the very privacy of your own home, which does include things that you put on the internet, can be taken as fact, as a professional who's speaking. And that opens you up to ethical and legal liabilities. I think that's really strong. And I think I'd like to get even a little bit more specific on some ideas around this, because to me, there's an element of public figures that we've not talked about yet that I think is important to consider. I know, and I'm sure you've had this happen too, that I will meet someone for the first time and they say, I feel like I know you. I listen to the podcast. And we are small potatoes compared to a president of the United States. I think there's an element to us feeling like we know public figures based on how they present to the public and the things that they do. And I think the more time you spend in public, the more of your real self shows up. I think we discount that some people play a role. Arguably, people will have the more time they spend in public, the more likely they are to show their real self. But there is a, a version of this where Trump's acting all the time and it has, is playing a role in order to get what he wants. And does that suggest narcissism? Maybe. But if it's all pretend, can we really diagnose him? You know, and I think with the the limitations of the knowledge that we have, I think we have to be very cautious about what we say. We don't know someone based on a small snippet of social media or even sometimes hour long videos of their behavior. I think we do need to to be cautious of saying, well, we have enough information. We can make this diagnosis. We have a whole uh episode or several episodes on people making assumptions on the internet. So we can link to some of those in the show notes as well. And so to me, I think it comes back to what information do I actually have, making sure I discuss the limits of the information. And then I think that the third thing that is really important is what is my intent? And this is, you know, for all the DBT folks, this is getting into wise mind. And I think for, for, those of us who are advocates, it's determining, is this strategic? Is this about trying to win an election like it was with the Goldwater stuff? Is it about a duty to warn because society is going down rapidly and we need to call this out and, and name it? Um, or anything else? Like, what is the actual intention? Am I angry? Am I scared? How is that impacting my, my judgment? I think it's something where if we just speak from a place of seat in my pants, this is what I'm seeing and it's scary and it's awful because this person is politically different from me. I think we get very into very, very dangerous territory as a society. To conclude all of this, I, I think you're summarizing it very, very well is that for many of our professional organizations that we may belong to at the master's level, there is not a ethical code that necessarily forbids this. Yeah. You need to really be cautious about framing the information upon how you're basing your opinions. And in general, I would stop well short of, you know, leading the trail of breadcrumbs up to a diagnosis. If you do have 
personal and professional concerns about somebody who may be out there and expressing this, whether you put it on your social media or what you think is your personal social media, those professional organizations are still going to look at that as a professional statement that you very carefully frame the context of where you're discussing these things from. Yeah. And I think that in several of these articles that we've been citing here, and we will put the uh, references in our show notes at mtsgpodcast.com, that what has changed since 2016 when this debate really started and why we feel that it's still a relevant discussion today is that some of these professional organizations have clamped down even harder in the last few years. And some of the information that's available out there or pops up to the top of your search engines is not necessarily the most up-to-date information. It's important to understand the historical context that where professional organizations are today is not where they started back when the Goldwater principle was first suggested. Some of these articles now are calling it the Goldwater Doctrine without necessarily putting it into any sort of ethical rigor to move things from a guiding principle to a absolute gag rule. So our recommendation is, is for most of you, it's not forbidden to make public commentary, but really, really make sure that you frame any sort of statements or exasperations or social media posts in ways that really frame how you are coming to your conclusion and what your relationship or lack thereof is to the person that you're talking about. We would love to hear your thoughts on this. You can let us know on our social media or in our Facebook group, the Modern Therapist Group. You can find our show notes and references at mtsgpodcast.com and stay tuned for more information on how to get continuing education for listening to this podcast. Until next time, I'm Kurt Whithelm with Katie Renoy. Just a quick reminder, if you'd like one unit of continuing education for listening to this episode, go to moderntherapistcommunity.com purchase this course and pass the post test. A CE certificate will appear in your profile once you've successfully completed the steps. Once again, that's moderntherapistcommunity.com. Thanks again to our sponsor, Buying Time. Buying Time's VAs support businesses by managing email communications, CRM or automation systems, website admin and hosting, email marketing, social media, bookkeeping, and much more. Their sole purpose is to create the opportunity for you to focus on supporting those you serve while ensuring that your back office runs smoothly. With a full team of VAs, it gives the opportunity to hire for one role and get multiple areas of support. There's no reason to be overwhelmed with running your business with this solution available. Book a consultation to see where and how you can get started getting the support you need. That's buyingtimellc.com forward slash book dash consultation. Once again, buyingtimellc.com forward slash book dash consultation. Hey everyone, Kurt and Katie here. (laughs) If you love this longer form content and would like to bring the conversations deeper, please support us on our Patreon. For as little as $2 per month, we're able to bring you more content, exclusive offerings, and more opportunities to engage in our growing modern therapist community. These contributions help us to expand our offerings for continuing education, events, and a whole lot more. If you don't think you can make a monthly contribution, no worries. We also have a Buy Me a Coffee profile for one-time donations. Support us at whatever level that you can today. It really helps us out. You can find us at patreon.com forward slash MTSG podcast or buymeacoffee.com forward slash modern therapist. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes.